Erev Tov Harim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, and we are going in this evening about the parents' rights uh, that recently in Israel has been uh, proposed to be put into law, taking away the rights from the parents, giving children rights over their own parents. And as I was getting ready to come back and look at this here again, um, actually, let me real quick go to our Israeli News Live on Facebook because this is where the original article is. Kind of hard to find it at this point here. So let me just quickly um, run into Israeli News Live, pull this up for you. Uh, Moshe Feiglin, uh, who used to be part of the Likud party, uh, but uh, is no longer part of that, he actually um, has come out against this himself. And, um, and I'm glad to see that he's making this stand as well. Uh, he was running for... Uh, Prime Minister, but some of the issues that uh, were confronted uh, against him by the uh, by Prime Minister Netanyahu caused him to lose this particular race there. But he's probably one of the best candidates it could be for Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, I'm hoping we actually put this article on our Israeli News Live. I'm I'm not seeing it at this particular moment there. Uh, maybe maybe we didn't. Maybe we didn't get it up there. Uh, I thought we did though. But. Uh, Okay, well, I guess not then. Uh, at any rate, though, let's, let's go back then to uh, Moshe Feiglin's uh, response to this. Uh, this here, he says here, Feiglin on the anti-parent bill, Stalin is here, is his response to it uh, on, on this particular bill. It says, Moshe Feiglin has come out against the proposed parents and their children law, which the Ministerial Committee on Legislation approved for legislation Sunday, calling it a frightening law. Now, see, it's already been approved, and I had several of you guys that actually sent me information letting me know this is actually part of the New World Order agenda. It is part of the Agenda 21 uh, plan. Uh, and I'm, I've, I found some articles I'm going to share with you in a moment. Let's finish looking at what Fagelin said about this. He said, The divorced fathers who support the law because of the cancellation of the tender years clause, which currently gives mothers an advantage over fathers in custodies of children after divorce, will wind up bitterly disappointed. The head of the Zahut party predicted on Facebook, the, uh, the courts will only make rare use of this clause in favor of the fathers. By the way, the, uh, the Kahoot, uh, Zahut party that uh, is a party that Feiglin actually started after leaving the Likud party there, just so you're aware of that. He says, but the parents who got to raise their children in married bliss will discover that the last vestige of their parental authority has been taken from them. Um, he goes on to say, he explained that the law replaces the natural guardianship of parents over their children as set in the law in 1962, which parental responsibility that means in practice that their guardianship over the child is now the hands of the state, uh, which does the biological parent a favor by letting him hold on to the child as long as it deems fit. Uh, Fagelin pointed out that the clause of the root shiva has been emphasizing its exclusive reports on the bill. If, for instance, the court decides that the parents are not teaching their children to respect people regardless of race, religion, nationality, or origin, uh, as the law states, then the state will be able to take the child back into its hands. Um, this is very, very concerning to me because it, it, it sounds like the exact words that Pope Francis put out not too long ago. Uh, when the Charlie Hebdo incident happened and the people were murdered there at the news place, and instead of Pope Francis coming out and condemning the atrocity that was done by the terrorists, he actually sided with the terrorists and stating that when you speak against someone's religion, these type things are going to happen, basically justifying the terrorists. So when I say this is a lot like Pope Francis type of thinking here is because Pope Francis is expecting that the entire world is to be in agreement with every religion and be passive and accept every religion that there is without any issues there and that your children should be uh, very much in tune with these religions. Well, I can understand why it's for the Muslim people is because they created the Muslim religion. Unfortunately, many of the Arabic people in the world do not know that they are a Vatican-created religion. 
They've been duped into this. And I, I feel for the Arabic people because they have no idea that they're following a false god that has nothing to do with anything, uh, something that the Vatican made up. And of course, the Vatican is run by Satan. So the one that gets all the worship is Satan himself. When the Muslims worship, they worship the devil. They don't, Allah is not a god. He is not, he's not the god of heaven, period. He's not the god of Israel at all. Even though they run through the street and say, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, you know, God, uh, God is greater. Their God, uh, nonsense. It's all nonsense. Anyway, um, the point is, though, this is exactly what the Vatican uh, was, was trying to do, is to bring this all about, putting this together. Now, let me share with you a little bit. This is from a book here called... Um, Tactics of the New World Order, Agenda 21, and Your Child. A little excerpt here. He says, I recalled a child proudly standing with others in class reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Afterwards, we bowed our heads and said a silent prayer. Goodness and loyalty to country was instilled in us at an early age during my early school years. Adolescence, pregnancy, school shootings, and suicides were practically unheard of. In fact, in my own early years, you, you still prayed in school. You still were paddled if you misbehaved in school. Uh, and pregnancies, you didn't go to school if you were pregnant. It was considered a shame. Um, a lot of things have changed since then, but let's read on. He says, once prayer and uh, patriotism were taken out of our schools, children became easy targets for indoctrination into a belief that will be, uh, there will be destruction of what is left of Christian America. Most schools no longer show any signs of belief in God or creationism. Those who do are in constant fear of being sued. Instead, we sit on the sidelines and observe as a silent war goes on around us. It's a goal in the New World Order. The global elite know that it is too late to change your mind, but not your child's. Getting to them early as possible has been a tactic used by socialists for many years, he states. The word kindergarten came from 19th century Germany, means garden of children. Kindergarten is a perfect place to begin work on your child's beliefs, he states. Um, if, uh, if history gives us any warning at all, it is that the first tactic socialist regimes used to gain control of a country is to indoctrinate the children in the direction that the leaders believe it. Worked for Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, and it works today. Many years ago in Germany, the children sang the praises of Adolf Hitler. Today, it's, the, it's Barack Obama, which they are singing his praises now. We should be very mindful of this, for this is not just a coincidence. Our children are slowly being indoctrinated into accepting a godless society. The author of the book there, Christian Myers, makes these comments here. And it's exactly that Fagelin, he called it a Stalin type of regime. Well, Hitler would have probably been better than Stalin when it comes right to that. But anyway, I wanted to share that with you and then take you over as well. Another website, this is eagleforum.org. Uh, those of you, I'll try to remember to put this in the comment section. I'm trying to get better about that on YouTube. You won't see it though on live stream here where you're watching now. Uh, but for those of you on live stream, it's forward slash PSR forward slash 1993 forward slash MAR 93 forward slash PSR MAR 93 dot HTML. Gosh, that's a lot of things. I bet none of you guys can write that fast. So anyway, maybe type that fast, but not writing it that fast. Anyway, um, this is called the New World Order Wants Your Children. Now, here in Europe, where I'm at right now, and I'm kind of stuck here for the next couple of months. We can't, I can't travel because I'm going through uh, the, uh, the process of, of, uh, of my permanent residency here. So I have to stay in the country until that is completed. Uh, but anyway, so uh, hopefully I get back into Israel come January. Uh, but it says uh, this, this one, when I went to open up this website, it was really hard to get it open because the governments here really monitor what we watch. I can only imagine what it's like to be in Russia. Uh, although I agree with Putin on several other things that he has done in the past, I don't necessarily agree with him on everything. But, uh, of course, one thing I don't agree on is he totally blacks out his people on the Internet and what they can see. Anyway, it says here, the Children's Defense Fund, the CDF, the chief vehicle for those who want government to take over the raising of their children, has a new goal under the Clinton administration. You've got to keep in mind, this is a 1993 document here, but it'll let you know how this all came about. Um, 
The advocacies, uh, having failed to get Congress to pass the cost of the ABC child care bill, the CDF, is now pushing to get a United Nations treaty on children signed and adopted so that children advocacy lawyers can assert children's rights against their parents. Now, if you remember, when we read the article the other day to you, the Israeli article, it's the same thing. It's asserting the child's right above the parents. But what's funny is they're using social workers to represent the children. So the child really has no rights. They might say the child has rights, but the child has no rights. It's the social worker that has the rights. It's the state that has the rights. And they can just manipulate the child's mind and determine whatever they want. They can, they can do whatever they want at this particular point. Anyway, so it says here, can assert children's rights against the parents since Hillary Clinton was chair of the CDF's board of directors from 1986 to 1991 since she was succeeded as CDF chair in 1991 by Donna uh, Shala, Shalala, now secretary of HHS, is since CDF CEO Marion Wright Edelman. As Hillary's close friend, we can anticipate an aggressive effort by the Clinton administration on behalf of this treaty. The treaty is called the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. It was unanimously adopted by the UN General Assembly on November 20th, 1989, and signed by more than 100 foreign governments. Now, President George Bush did not sign the treaty. Uh, he did not send it to the Senate for ratification. There are dozens of excellent reasons for, for why he rejected it. But anyway, the article goes on to read, if the text of the UN treaty were proposed as a new federal legislation, the bill would never pass. It would be unacceptable to the American people because it would give the federal government too broad a grant power over our children, families, and schools, and it would be unconstitutional because of both vagueness and federal interference with states' rights. But the treaty has been blessed by the United Nations and lawyered with lofty goals and high-sounding words. Its salesmen are peddling it with pathetic stories of the uh, mistreatment of children such as outrageous murderers in Bolivia. CDF and 150 libel advocacy groups in the United States have made it a cause and are even using it as a uh, lit litmus test to try to label Congress as pro-children or anti-children. You know, one thing that keeps coming up to my mind, though, as I look at this and something that maybe you guys have, have thought of yourself already, and that is during World War II, one of the chief entities that were taking in children was the Vatican. The Catholic Church were taking children. These children were being taken from the Jews forcibly, placed into Catholic homes, being adopted by them secretly, growing up as Catholics, those that weren't murdered, that is, by the Germans, but they were secretly adopted by the Catholic people and raised to make, believe, or make the children believe the way the Catholic Church wanted them to believe. This is what I see with this bill. And I know some people might say, well, Steve, you know, you kind of, you put the Catholic Church in the middle of everything. You, you have to remember, they are in control of this entire world system. And I even, when I look at the issue with uh, Vladimir Putin in Syria and the United States also putting troops there, I cannot help but they all work in concert together. I mean, think about it. Look at the way these men meet each other. Even though Putin comes and meets Obama and he meets the Pope of Rome and, and, and Obama does the same, they all meet with each other. They all meet together like they're buddy-buddy. But the soldiers on the battlefields are doing all the fighting of the wars. These men here seem to be what you would call civilized. But they let other people do the fighting. It reminds me of attorneys, the prosecutor as well as the defense attorney. After they go and try a case, they leave the courtroom and go to the same bar together and drink together. In fact, I knew for a fact on some inside information on several cases that I had seen happen in the United States where the attorneys would meet together privately outside of anything where people could publicly accuse them of anything and they would discuss which cases the prosecutor would get and which, which one of uh, the defense attorneys would give up of their clients to let them go to jail while the other one would get off. It's nothing but a political game. And this is what I see going on in the world scheme of things as well as far as world leaders. You have to remember, the Bible says if Satan's kingdom is divided, it cannot stand. This is what Jesus said. 
He said, if Satan is against him, if Satan can cast out Satan, then his kingdom is divided. It can't stand. Well, Satan is ruling the entire world. Only for a season, of course. And he even challenges Jesus. He challenged Yeshua when he was up there uh, during the 40 days and 40 nights. And he says to him, he shows him in a moment of time, all the worlds, everything that ever would be. He says, these are all mine. He says, I'll give them to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, if you'll notice, Yeshua never argued the fact that they were his. But he tells him, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, Satan is over all these kingdoms. And what is the reason for the fighting or the things that go on in the background? Well, who knows? And I'm sure there are maybe some differences out there where world leaders hate one another. But clearly... A lot of these Illuminati-led world leaders are perfectly together in unison and maybe it's to fulfill the global agenda, and that is depopulation. Create wars. Why? Because the leaders are not going to get killed in the middle of the war. The leaders are just going to go and still wear their suits and go to their little parties afterwards and meet the other world leaders in some other little Camp David in America or, or some place in Italy or, or France or Germany or Russia or wherever they're going to meet at. But in the meantime, they'll displace people, turn lives upside down, kill people and everything else. All for a depopulation agenda. And of course, now they want the control of the minds of your children. Maybe it's because the Vatican has a plan for your children, like they did during Nazi Germany when Hitler was going around and killing all the Jews that he could possibly find and, and all kinds of other people as well. You know, the gypsies, everything else, they decided to annihilate them as well. If you were sick, if you were um, had Down syndrome, he annihilated you as well. He was definitely doing a depopulation agenda. Maybe at the time the Vatican thought we had too many people then as well. Who knows? But nonetheless, they have a depopulation agenda. But perhaps they want to get control of the children because they're going to depopulate the humans again, the, the adults. I can't really say as far as what's going to go on there. Let's take a little, a little bit more look at this article here. It says, it is always important to scrutinize proposed treaties even more carefully than ordinary legislation first because treaties can be ratified at any time by two-thirds of the U.S. Senate senators present and voting. Uh, and with two senators voting, uh, excuse me, and, and the second because the preferential status which treaties enjoy in the American system government. One ratified, once ratified, they become part of the supreme law of the land, along with the U.S. Constitution and federal laws. Uh, at any time a treaty is proposed, we should study the language as well as the intent and consider a worst-case scenario how the treaty's provision in the hands of uh, the international bodies over which we have no control could imperil American sovereignty and the rights of American citizens. And this is where the issue is with all this. This is where we're really facing a major, major problem uh, with this particular uh, Agenda 21 and uh, parents losing the rights over their children. It's really, it's, it's revoking the parental rights of the children. The New World Order is doing that and it is targeting the children completely, uh, or targeting the parents of the children to where the state can take control of them. And we've seen this as well in the United States, uh, in the public school system. Many of you guys, in fact, if you would, re leave a comment about what you may be aware of in your own school system there in the United States. But my wife is a uh, high school teacher teaching biology in the United States. They were already, before we left uh, about a year and a half ago, the United States, they had already set up in the school, the parents had to contribute to a provision, emergency provision thing for the schools, to where in the event of some kind of catastrophe, the school already has the right to take the children and leave without any parental consent and go to an undisclosed location. They actually did some drills like that in Florida and caused major panic among parents. Another thing that we saw happen um, back then before we're leaving is that, that uh, my wife had come in the following year there to do teaching and they had a whole new set of rules and guidelines. They had all of a sudden, all the students had to have IDs, uh, ID cards, Parents were not allowed to come in the school. 
you know, when you were coming to pick up your kids, you were to, you were to remain in a vehicle. You could not get out of your vehicle. You had to pull up if you were a parent that was picking up your child by car and they would bring the child to you. Uh, parents were, were really getting upset over this. In fact, one parent kind of put up a fuss over it and they threatened to bring the police and have them arrested. And I believe there was one or two in Florida that did get arrested over this just for trying to pick up their child. And it is slowly but surely in the United States, they're conditioning the people. They're taking away your rights and they're conditioning the parents in the United States for the same thing that Israel's already doing. They're already conditioning you there. They're doing it with the school system. And I think that this is a conditioning slowly but surely because they're going to enforce a United Nations resolution here. They're going to bring about Agenda 21. And I didn't get a chance to find that actual New World Order document there that stated that. I got kind of caught up with some other things today. Uh, but it, it's serious, friends. It's very serious. Uh, at any rate, let me, uh, one other thing I want to take you to real quick, though, in closing here is the Israeli news that is going on. We have got some serious things still happening in Israel. Um, we have uh, in Netanyahu, this, this happened here only just a couple of hours ago. And uh, there was a, I think he was in his 70s, the man that was stabbed by a terrorist there in, in Netanya. Sorry, not Netanya, Netanya is the name of the city there. It's a beautiful little city there just north of Tel Aviv. Uh, we actually looked at um, trying to rent an apartment there because it is nice. It's, it's, uh, when I say nice, it's away from uh, a lot of the bad neighborhoods. You're not bordering along with Palestinians in this particular town. And uh, it just seemed to be a good place to, to raise children at in Israel. So we had looked sincerely and, and almost leased an apartment there in Netanya. Uh, and so when I opened up uh, Israel National News here only about an hour ago and I saw this article here, Netanya Terrace was shouting Allah Akbar and he stabs a 70-something-year-old man, I was completely shocked by it. Let's look at this. There's further details about the Netanya attack. Uh, have been released later Monday night in the wake of the third stabbing of the day. Third stabbing of the day in Israel. Um, initial reports indicate that the stabber, a 22-year-old man from the northern Sumerian town of uh, Tokarm, first attacked a, a couple, stabbing a 71-year-old man in the back. The victim was later transported to a Lenado Hospital in critical condition. condition. Uh, witnesses told uh, Walla News the terrorist was shouting Allah Akbar. Traffic police officers uh, of the Sharon region called for the terrorist to stop, but he kept running, throwing his knife at a nearby building. Officers at the scene stated that at one point the, the terrorist turned around and pulled out another knife. Secu security officer forces shot him three times, leaving him in serious condition. Um, that's a big concern as well because if terrorists start taking, stabbing the people and then just abandon their knives and then leave it to where the police are kind of forced not to shoot them, uh, that can only, <laughs> it could be a new tactic coming out altogether. Anyway, it says officers at the scene stated that, that at one point the terrorist turning around and pulled out another knife, security forces shot him three times, leaving him in serious condition. Shortly after the stabbing, another bystander attempted to attack the terrorist uh, when he was already shot, police arrested the, the Netanya man at the scene, not to be deterred. Dozens of furious Netanya, Nata, uh, Netanya uh, residents who had witnessed the attack attempted to prevent the terrorist of Monday night's stabbing attack in the city from being transported to the hospital. Footage reveals blocking the road as the ambulance began to leave. This is what Israelis are going through, friends. Day, day in and day out, Israelis are having to face this very thing right here. As we see here in the, in the screenshot here, they, the people come running through. They're running through, trying to get away from, from, a, from a man wielding a knife. I guess people are screaming as he's going along stabbing people. Uh, at this point here, some of the people run into the store for safety there. And this older woman who cannot run, he just drives that knife into her back and keeps on running. And of course, there are people after him, uh, I guess trying to stop him. But it is just a terrible, terrible scene, to say the very least. Um, and whether or not, whether or not uh, anyone else was uh, able to put a stop to this guy, it's not clear. Um, a lot of people are going down the sidewalk here. I guess it's because there's more than one victim uh, involved in this. And according to the article here, it says, On Monday afternoon, a 19-year-old Palestinian Arab terrorist from Hebron stabbed three people in the Tel Aviv area city on eight 
an 80-year-old woman, a 35-year-old man, and a 26-year-old man. The three are listed in serious, moderate, and light conditions, respectively. Uh, very, very sad indeed. Of course, the serious woman is the 80-year-old woman that we've seen here in the screen that was stabbed, uh, that was caught on the CT CCTV footage there. And like I said, friends, it is just continually... Uh, let me just kind of run you through the articles here, just so you can see some of these here. Stabbing in Netanya, which is one we brought out already to you. Uh, also, another article that came out about the Hen uh, Henkins fought terrorists before they were murdered. Now, that's the, the case where the husband and wife were gunned down in their car while their children were yet in the car. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at that story as of yet. Three injured in Rish, uh, Rishon Lezion stabbing attack. Arab assaulted a ready woman with a glass bottle. Uh, also, a terrorist shot and failed stab, a stabbing attempt. Firebomb was thrown at Jerusalem District Court. Uh, and it just goes on and on and on and on. Mother of missing soldier slams return of terrorist bodies. Uh, Arab rock uh, terror uh, reaches uh, Haifa. Um, uh, and, and three border police are hurt in a car terror near Hebron. Now, we actually brought that one out in uh, yesterday's news there. It's, it's just constant. There's just no let up of this intifada whatsoever. And, and then on top of it, then the Israeli government is beginning to pull back the, uh, and put tighter restrictions on the military and how they can uh, confront these terrorists running around with knives, just stabbing anybody, anybody and everybody. They, they, they have no care, no regard for life whatsoever. Anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live. Those of you that are watching on live stream, God bless you for being here tonight. And those of you that catch us on YouTube, God bless you as well, and thank you for watching. Shalom.